and they wasted no time. Sat us down, just like what I've always seen on TV, Mr. and Mrs. Bame. I regret to inform you that your daughter Katie has been killed in a car accident. So that was really the moment that my life became distinctly divided into two timelines, before and after. Welcome back to the You Need a Counselor podcast. This is a show presented by Heart and Solutions Counseling Agency. We release new episodes every Sunday at 5 p.m. Central and encourage you to batch up that laundry, put away the dishes, plan for the week ahead, or do any other task that might seem daunting while you give our show a listen. You might just be encouraged to call your therapist, connect with this week's guest, or seek out those services you've been considering for a while but haven't made the commitment to yet. If you are in the state of Iowa and are in need of mental or behavioral health counseling, give us a call at 1-800-531-4236. Enjoy the show. Hello, welcome back to the You Need a Counselor podcast. My name is Dr. Julie Johnson. I'm the president and founder here at Heart and Solutions, mental health counseling and behavioral health counseling in Iowa. And I'm Krista Hunt. I am our vice president in charge of the behavioral health department. And this is our podcast, You Need a Counselor. So we are a podcast designed for people curious about counseling, but have barriers keeping them from experiencing the benefits of counseling. Our mission is to share stories about counseling, good, bad, and indifferent, and spread the message that everyone can benefit from mental health and behavioral health counseling services. Our guest today is Lisa Baim. Lisa has experienced an unthinkable tragedy. And she has used this unthinkable tragedy and time in her life where things seemed the darkest, where things seemed unsurmountable. And she has utilized this experience and the things that she learned about herself, the feelings and emotions that she allowed herself to feel and experience and heal from uh, to help other people now as an author, as a speaker, as a podcaster. She is the host of Rising Strong, Midlife Burnout and Resilience. We're so excited to hear, especially about the resilience piece uh, after after tragedy that uh, completely changes our lives, completely changes our whole identity uh, and our whole day-to-day living. So welcome, Lisa. Thank you so much for being here. It's my pleasure. I'm so excited to be here. Thanks, guys. Wonderful. So uh, I'm going to open it up. Will you tell us your story of the before and the after? Mm -hmm. Well, I think anybody who's been through a tragic event or a monumentous event will describe their own timeline as, you know, in before and after terms. But uh, as my bio mentioned, um, you know, I was living an ordinary life. And, you know, happy family, mom, dad, two kids at home. My two kids were in high school. My husband and I both work at the hospital. And um, that evening, you know, we were, we finished dinner and my daughter had been working in the home office where I'm sitting right now. And at about seven o'clock, she came out of the office and she said, oh, mom, I forgot. I've got to run this errand. I'll be right back. And she pulled on her Ugg boots and her army green parka and out the door she went so quickly that I never really even had a chance to say, hey, we'll see you in a bit or anything like that. And at 945 that evening, I was getting my pajamas on and my kids always had to be home at 10 o'clock on a school night. And I sent her a text and I just said, hey, I hope you're on your way. See you soon. And no sooner had I climbed into bed with my book. And my husband climbed in beside me that we heard ding dong. And we both looked at each other because we thought, why is Katie ringing the doorbell? So my husband got out of the out of bed and I could hear him walking to the door. But instead of hearing Katie's giggly voice, we heard or I heard rather a very um, authoritative male voice. So you can believe I was out of bed in a shot. And there in my front entry stood a police officer and a lady in black who I later learned was the coroner. And they wasted no time, sat us down, just like what I've always seen on TV, Mr. and Mrs. Bame. I regret to inform you that your daughter Katie has been killed in a car accident. 
So that was really the moment that my life became distinctly divided into two timelines before and after. As I hear you telling the story of that night that Katie was killed, I, I hear you talking about so many of the sounds, the 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 sights, you know, the colors and how the the officer's voice sounded and how it felt when you were getting into bed and getting ready to read and all of these things uh, that it sounds like before that was just a totally typical evening. And, and then coming in and hearing all of the senses and all of the experiences of that night uh, and the loss of Katie and then going through. So now then, what was that experience like for you in the after? It sounds like the after started right then and there when they mm -hmm. told you that Katie had been killed. What was What was your experience? What were you thinking about at that moment? You know, it's amazing what goes through your mind at these at these times. Um, we were very fortunate, <laughs> if, you know, not maybe the best word to use, but fortunate in the sense that we had two very compassionate people who came to our home that night, meaning the police officer in the corner. Um, clearly, they were very trained to do this. But I remember sitting on the couch, you know, with my husband on one side and my then 15 year old son on the other side. And the fact was that I was not crying, which still disturbs me on some level. But, you know, the more I learn about reactions and shock and all of that kind of thing, you know, I've, I've come, I've made peace with it. But I was literally jumping off the couch. Like I was bouncing, I was shaking so badly. I was bouncing off the couch. Um, I don't know even what to compare it to. But I remember, you know, the officer was sitting on an ottoman just across from me. Like I probably could have reached out and touched him. He was that close. But it was like my mind just went mm, almost like in the movie theater, you know, where I was just I was completely shutting out the sound of his voice. And my mind just started to go like, what now? What now? What, what, what? you know, my my son was 15 at that time in his life prior to even losing Katie. He was going down, um, you know, some teenage roads that every parent fears, you know, tells their kids not to do. He was doing it tenfold. Um, and I just remember thinking, dear God, you know, the situation with my son is either going to go this way or that way. It's either going to get better or it's going to get worse. Um, and just thinking, what the heck, you know, like everything that I had imagined as as a mother, you know, you never plan to have a family and then have one of your children die. That that's not part of the plan. How do you keep your marriage together? You know, as a healthcare professional, I had all these stats like downloading into my brain. You know, 74% of marriages don't last and, you know, most siblings of in situation like this are faced with a life of mental health issues, drug use, so on and so forth, and just being horrified is that now my life, which was once on, on this path, was now taking like a 90 degree turn without any warning and just wondering what the heck was going to happen to my family. Yeah, as you're describing it, I was noticing that like, you're like, okay, what about my son? What's going to happen to him or my husband mm -hmm. and my marriage? So thinking kind of like about everyone else and how to keep them okay do you think at first it was hard to even focus on like your own feelings and your own self and you were trying to like just project on everyone else well and that's where I ran into trouble to be fully honest because I remember um you know sitting on the couch and in that moment like in my mind's eye imagining my my right arm and my left arm encompassing my husband and son and holding on to them for dear life um but in doing so at about the six or seven month mark, I hit what I'm calling rock bottom. And I know a lot of people use that term when they're referring to drug and alcohol use. That is not what I'm talking about. What I am referring to is suicidal ideation because I think I was pouring every ounce of um, care and compassion and concern 
into keeping my little family together, supporting my husband, supporting my son in, in whatever way that I could, and really not focusing on myself and really, really struggled with a lot of darkness at that point. What are some things that you would have liked to have heard or experienced, or if you could go back and talk to yourself at that six or seven month mark, what might you say? Well, I think what I did say, um, and eventually it did bubble to the surface. I always was focused on making my daughter in heaven proud. You know, what would Katie think? Um, I mean, I feel her presence all the time, but I always kind of imagine her over my right shoulder observing my life, you know, and, and just thinking, what would Katie think? What would Katie think? <laughs> I mean, my daughter was 17 and a half. She was feisty. She did not have a filter. She was saucy and spicy, and she would have no problems telling a stranger what she thought. So for her mother, she would have laid it all out. She would have kicked me in the behind for starters and said, come on, mom, this is not what I want to be watching. Um, and I also kind of had this, moment of clarity. You know, I was so concerned about my son and so concerned about my husband, but really because I wasn't taking care of myself properly and I was struggling mentally, you know, I kind of had this flash forward, if you will, of, you know, if I had done something tragic to take my own life, where would that leave them? Would that ever help them get their feet underneath themselves? Would that, you know, be better support for them? Like everything that I thought about, it was like, Lisa, if you care about your husband and your son so much, you need to get the help that you need. It's not an option. You need it. Yeah. So then it sounds like, I mean, even then when you got help for yourself, like, okay, it's for my husband and son too. Like I need to help myself now. So kind of seeing that full circle, like instead of focusing on them, maybe focusing more on yourself. Um, how was that experience in like getting into counseling and finding a counselor um, to deal with your suicidal ideation? How did that journey go? You know, um, I, I'm somebody that believes that we all need a therapist, like whether you're going through tough stuff or not, like we, we laugh about this at work, but in all seriousness, like we all need a therapist. Um, so I had been seeing somebody already and I'm so grateful because, um, you know, where I live, it's tough, it's tough to get in. And then, you know, you want somebody that you have rapport with. And I've talked to a lot of grieving mothers who are, they kind of have a hard line. They don't want to see anybody who hasn't lost a child because they can't possibly understand. But my experience was I was seeing this lady who had not lost a child, but she was exactly the right person for me. A, she called me out on my own BS, which I really needed, right? Because I think we get in our own heads. I'm doing this and I'm doing this and I'm doing this. And she'd say, yeah, good, but you're not doing this. You know, and she would pull me back and she would really, really keep me focused on, on taking care of myself, frankly. But um, what I loved about therapy is that I think a good therapist has the ability to pull, gently pull back the layers because it doesn't matter if it's grief, it doesn't matter if it's divorce, it doesn't matter if it's childhood trauma, whatever it is. As human beings, we're complex creatures and we do have layers and I think even in the work that I do, we can't always get to the grief straight off the bat. Sometimes there's other stuff that needs to be dealt with from our past before we can get in there. And that's where my therapist was so helpful. And I just, I feel so, so fortunate that I have had such an excellent experience going through therapy and continue to go through therapy. Absolutely. I, I love that you already had that relationship established. So often these kinds of 
unthinkable situations. These are the kinds of situations that will bring somebody to therapy. And you had already laid that foundation. You were going into session with somebody that you already trusted. You already had rapport with. You didn't have to, on top of all the other things you were trying to do for yourself and for your family at that time, you didn't have to add find a therapist and get on the waiting list and do the assessment and all of that to that that, that list of things. So uh, I think that is such a great point of even when things are not happening in our life that we think, oh, I need a therapist, we need one anyway, because we never, ever know when something's going to happen and we're going to need that relationship already established. I loved what you said about pulling back the layers in therapy, and you had mentioned that uh, sometimes there are those other layers before we can even get to the grief. Uh, what were some of those layers that you experienced that were kind of between where you were and getting into the heart of, of the grief that you were experiencing? Family can be really difficult in challenging times, and I think their beliefs, their messages get transferred to us, whether it's very obvious or whether it's subliminal. And because of the difficulties we were having with our son, um, I was I was getting some very challenging messages from my parents who I know love me, who I know want the best for me. Um but were giving me messages that I needed to put my grief on the back burner, that my marriage needed to be the focus, and that at three months after losing Katie, I needed to cut my son out of my life. So these were the messages that I was carrying around on my shoulders and in my gut, which I tend to trust most of the time, my gut was saying, no. No, you know, like my son needs me now more than ever. I had a hard line in the sand, you know, um, I had boundaries, but my son needed me now more than ever. My marriage, if it was all that and a bag of chips would be there on the back burner when I was mentally, physically, and emotionally ready for it. Um, and that I needed to, to, you know, find myself somewhere in this too. So I, I was bringing all of this mess, if you will, into therapy. And I think those were the layers of that really needed to be dealt with before I could really sit in my grief in therapy. What advice would you give to family members who have a family member who is going through grief? What should or shouldn't they say um, in those situations? Oh, that is that is a loaded question, actually. But to simplify things, I think we need to remember that no matter what our experience is, we can never truly know what someone is feeling and dealing with when they are the grievers. This is their journey, not yours. Even myself, as a grieving mother, as a certified grief educator, I cannot for a second assume that I can tell another grieving mother what to do, how to deal with it, you know, all of that kind of thing. And I think the hardest thing for a supporter to do is listen. Because a lot of folks who are grieving, whether they're grieving mothers, grieving the loss of a job or other of the many losses that we face in life, we need to unload. And that can be a comfort uncomfortable thing rather for supporters to do. But we need to tell our stories over and over and over and over and over and over again until we don't need to tell them without judgment. And we're not looking to get fixed. We're not looking, nobody has a magic wand to to make our situations better, but we do need to be listened to. Yeah, there's there's such a difference between communication as it typically serves its purpose of, okay, I need you to know that there's this section of uh, the wall that's still wet paint, right? Like that kind of communication of like, don't touch the wall, it's wet paint. 
that's a very useful type of communication, right? And that tends to be the kind of communication that we feel most comfortable with because it makes us feel like we're doing something, like we're helping the situation. And so uh, as a support person or a family member uh, of somebody who has experienced a loss and is grieving, it can be so tempting to go into that, well, this is what you need to do to feel better because all I want is for you to feel better. And that kind of communication of don't touch the wall, it's wet paint, uh, very, very helpful in so many situations, but there is a totally different kind of communication that is, has a purpose of healing. And it doesn't always get the, the uh, understanding that, that it needs that, no, you are serving a active purpose by listening to this story again, right? They say when you uh, experience, you got to tell eight people, right? Before you, before we start to experience and understand and start that processing for ourselves, we got to tell people what happened, and then we got to tell them again, and we got to tell them again because each time that we do we are reprocessing that situation. We're remembering different things. We're re-experiencing certain things and seeing them in a different way as we tell somebody else. And so being there with somebody, hearing what is happening and then hearing it again and just reflecting or noticing like, yeah, the last time you told me that, you didn't tell me about this other piece, right? Like that's interesting. Or like, oh, yeah. And you, it sounds like you're starting to find some meaning in this one part of it that happened, right? Uh, or you're starting to shift some of the blame that that you put on yourself over into the experience, the thing that happened, right? Uh, and so just noticing those things because you, you listened when the person told the story the first time and you listened when they told it the third time, it feels like, because we're in a very linear society, it feels like, well, that's the same story. That's the same thing that happened, but it isn't because all of our senses are going, all of our thoughts are going, all of our previous experiences are going in any given one millisecond. And so one moment in time can be experienced a thousand, 10,000 different ways. And our brains need to be able to go through that uh, with somebody else who can see it also from the outside and can show us the things like you said about your therapist. She shows me the things, right, that I that I don't see when I come in. Uh, and there is so much value in that. So I, I love that you're doing that and that you're helping uh, other people in your grief education that you're providing. You're helping other people to understand that as well. I liked what you said about the family members because it seems like that was such a strength for you or, or a source of strength for you and also every strength is a weakness and every weakness is a strength. And so your ability to be like, Hey, I I've got Katie on my shoulder. And what would she think about this situation? How would she want me to experience the rest of my life? Right. How would she want, how would she want me to show up for her brother? How would she want me to, you know, show up for this family and keep this family together? That is a huge strength. And then at the same time, uh, the ability to do that can lead to some challenges for us too when it's a different person on our shoulder, right? So uh, I just think it's so interesting what you shared about just how you go through that, how you utilize that as a strength, and also some of the challenges that you face there. So did your do you feel that your therapy changed after Katie's death? And if so, how how so? Um, when I was uh, seeking therapy prior to losing my daughter, um, you know, there was some of the, I'm going to say the usual things, right? Like, it was some marriage things and, you know, nothing was really awful, but I just felt like there were parts of my life that I needed support with and I needed a, a, a safe place, if you will, to share these things and to talk through them. I mean, I've got great friends, but um, I just really love how in in therapy 
we can go down all the bunny holes. And I'm always amazed at what bubbles to the surface, in all honesty. But uh, prior, yeah, to, prior to to losing Katie, it was a little bit of marriage and a little bit of career angst and, you know, raising teens and all of that kind of thing. And of course, after we lost Katie, it was like, you know, complete 180. And it was definitely grief 101 for the for the first while. But then uh, things really morphed into... Um, my son, who was still struggling at that time, and how how to create a, a container, if you will, that supported me, supported him, but also where I had clear boundaries. You know, how I did not have to give up my health, my entire being, all of my energy to support him but that I could create a container for myself as well and, and do both, but in a healthy balance. So that was the, the, you know, the focus for a long time going forward, because that continued to be a big struggle for us for probably two and a half, three years. And I just want to add the caveat that he is doing awesome now. He's 24 years old. You know, we bought a house two years ago. He's, he's a journeyman. He's, he's got is actually doing better than most 50 year olds I know, honestly. But um, so that was the focus. And I've just found that a good therapist will walk the journey with you. You know, you're not just stuck talking about one thing all the time, but that as we morph and grow as humans, and we do, whether we want to or not, that they are walking alongside of you and 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 morphing and, and changing the conversation as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you mentioned like how it switched to grief 101. And I know you're now also a grief educator. Can you give us some of that like grief 101 that maybe you learned from your therapist as well as what you also implement with your clients now that you're a grief educator? I would say the biggest grief 101 thing that I learned. Well, first of all, I'm just going to go back just a smidgen in the past. You know, as as a frontline healthcare professional, I have a whole half page of notes in my binder, you know, from from years back. And we learned about the five stages of grief and, you know, working in oncology, working with people who, you know, are sometimes at end of life you know, and being in touch with social workers and their families and all this, I thought I knew something about grief. And now I'm in this place where I want to apologize to every human I've ever worked with and say, I am so sorry. I didn't know a dang thing about grief until I lived grief. But I would say the biggest learning thing that I've taken away and where we needed to start um, and no disrespect to uh, the late Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, but that theory actually sets the griever up to feel like a failure. Because we are led to believe that there are five clear, distinct steps, stages, boxes that we go through. And that we magically end up at this stage of, of acceptance. And, you know, we, we, I could refute this whole thing for an hour, but in, in the interest of time, um, I was not angry. I was not angry. I did not experience anger at Katie's death. You know, um, I'm a very factual person. Um, I, I would say I quote unquote accepted Katie's death right off the hop because it was a fact. I didn't accept it in the sense that maybe the theory talks about, I don't know, but there's just so many things. And I think that, you know, I felt like I was doing grief wrong for a very long time because I wasn't a disaster all the time. I didn't feel some of these emotions that were laid out. Like I, I didn't bargain. Who am I going to bargain with? Am I going to bargain with God? God, can you give me my my 17-year-old daughter back, please? Like that just for my situation didn't work. Um, but for the listeners who may not be aware, this uh, the five stages of grief 
was actually developed for specifically for patients who are in the hospital who've been given a terminal diagnosis. So in my humble opinion, a completely different scenario than a family like mine who was completely like Katie was healthy until the minute that she collided with the semi truck. Um, So, you know, as a patient, I can see that you would go through bargaining, right? Please, 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 God, I don't want to die. You would go through denial. You would go through anger, you know, depression, and, and eventually maybe accept your diagnosis. So anyway, that that needs to be revisited or revised or just frankly garbaged. Um, and just really those first sessions were just, you know, really giving me the quote unquote permission to sit in my grief and, and experience my grief, however it presented itself, you know, and that instead of this staircase of five steps that you go through, um, just to allow myself to imagine that grief is like a bowl of spaghetti. It's a mess. You know, uh, every day is going to look different, especially in the beginning. Every five minutes might look different. And that's okay. Uh, learning that laughter, smiling, going to fun events was okay. You know, um, I think sometimes we think that I remember actually distinctly the first time that I actually smiled and felt happiness. And, you know, it was like a punch in the gut. It was like, oh my God, Lisa, what is wrong with you? Like, how dare you smile or feel this minute amount of happiness? But it was kind of like a big Oprah Winfrey aha moment when I realized that even though, you know, I had this moment and literally it was just a moment of happiness. I didn't, I never forgot Katie. My grief wasn't diminished at all. It was still there just as heavy, just as strong as ever. It was kind of this realization that, hey, I can carry grief in one hand and joy in the other. And it, neither one of them cancel each other out. And it was, it was a big learning moment for me that we don't experience our emotions just in silos. Like we're never just happy, right? Like I can't remember the number. It's a pretty big number of the number of emotions that we do experience uh, at the same time. You know, happiness might be the most dominant one at this particular minute, but there's all these other ones and that this is normal. You know, but we somehow think that if I feel this, I'm not grieving anymore and I'm a bad mother because, you know, I'm not grieving my child and and it's not that simple. So those are some of the things that we, we really dug into. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I mean, when you were telling the story of that night, you had mentioned, you know, I didn't cry. I, I had a, a physical reaction to the fact that was presented to me, but I, I did not cry. And, uh, and so often because of not only because of the stages of, we're in such a linear society that it's yes. like oh, yeah, stages, of course, like, you know, oh, I can look forward to the next one and then I'll get through that. Right. And especially, uh, I mean, I know you, you have a podcast about midlife burnout. And so I'm assuming high achiever, high achievers love linear steps. We love linear processes. We love like, how can I be good at this? Um, and grief doesn't care about <laughs> any of that it de- like we can't productiveness our way to it we can't act sad enough to be good at grieving and uh and so it can feel like this dichotomy so often of like joy or happiness is the opposite of grief and it's not the opposite of grief at all uh my my child is seven or she's eight and she will say like oh happy, sad as an opposite, right? When she's doing up or down or whatever it is. And uh, and the fact is, those are not opposites <laughs> at all. Those are two completely separate feelings. They don't have a give and a pull or a give and a take with each other. Um, and so that feeling of, oh, if I'm feeling happy or if I'm laughing or if I'm having a good time with my son or my husband, does that mean that it's taking away from my grief or that I'm not doing grief correctly? So I love what you're saying about like, there isn't a way to do it 
correctly. And uh, and I always love the imagery. Of, I love the spaghetti. That's wonderful. It's so accurate. Um, and I, I also love the imagery of grief is a river because uh, we're in Iowa. We have a lot of rivers and some of them you can tube down, right? Like some of them uh, are like, okay, I'm in the river, in grief, but my tube can kind can still kind of flow, right? My life can still go, go forward. Uh, and then other parts of the river, you're standing up and holding your, carrying your tube because there's sticks and there's trees that are down in the water and there's, you know, the river's down. So there's giant hunks of land in the way of processing through that. And you, uh, what I love about the river analogy, and it's not my own, uh, but what I love about it is that we can still move forward. We just move forward differently in those complex situations. Um, and so to say, well, I'm not sitting in my tube floating down the river. So I'm doing this wrong. I, uh, right. Is kind of what sometimes can, we can default to when the truth is like, if I'm standing up and holding my tube around the middle of me and walking down this bank that's emerged, right. Or if I'm stepping over these sticks and crawling under stuff, I'm still moving. I'm still in the grief. I'm still in the river, even if I'm not floating down it the way that I think I'm supposed to. Um, so I, I love the spaghetti example as well. That is beautiful because it is messy. Um, mm -hmm. All of the pieces tie together. And when you talked about what you had originally gone to therapy to talk through, uh, all of those were aspects that are highly uh, connected and intertwined with the loss of Katie. Uh, and so it it doesn't take away from those things. It further intertwines them uh, with the grief that we're experiencing. So uh, beautiful imagery. And I love that you're doing that education with others. So how are you uh, providing that education? What is that format for? Is it for support people? Is it for people going through grief? That grief education? You know, I uh, I found in my own grief journey that there was a lot of non-clinical resources out there, but I found that a lot of them were so dark and so heavy, you know, so the, the support that I provide is peer support, but even the groups that I was seeking out early in my grief journey, you know, I was again, having people, your life is over. You're never, you know, your marriage is going to, you know, go in the toilet and this and this. And I thought, okay, guys, I know, I know I'm living this. Like, I know this is hard. I needed hope. I needed encouragement. I needed, dare I say, some positivity. Um, and I couldn't find it. So I swore that I was going to create a space. And that's ultimately what I've done. So, you know, it's, it's not so much for folks. It's specifically for grieving mothers, but it's not for those in acute grief, because I think that that is its own unique phase. And that is really needs to be handled by a therapist. Truly, truly believe that. But once they get to a point where they think, okay, I think because we're never, we, there's never a clear point. Like there, those stages do not exist, but they think I've got to live with this for the rest of my life, but I want to try to figure out how I can carry my grief in one hand, as we said a few minutes ago and learn to live with it. And honestly, to bring our children with us too. Like, I think that, that there's this idea that healing or, or, or managing our grief means that we have to, you know, put our, our, the memory of our children behind us and move, move ahead. Um, and I, I disagree with that. I think that that part of the grief journey and learning to live with it is learning to um, bring our children with us. And how do we do that? How do we incorporate them into our lives in a clearly very different way? Um, but how can we do this? How can we carry joy? How can we carry grief? How can we bring our children forth? And so the sessions that I do are not what I would call a traditional support group because I didn't find that terribly helpful. Uh, maybe some people do, but I think there comes a point, as we mentioned, telling our story over and over again is an important part of the healing journey, definitely. 
But there comes a point when telling our story over and over again and listening to, you know, 10 other people tell their story is not helpful anymore. That we need to take steps to figure out this thing called life after grief. And so what we do is every week I I bring, I get together resources and so on. And we always have discussion and it's always learning based. Um, and not to say I have all the answers, but I'll bring an opinion in and do some research and we'll talk about it. We'll, uh, we'll have guest speakers come in who have an experience in different areas, whether it be, you know, I've had psychologists on, I've had um, psychics on, I've had, you know, breathwork people, yoga people, like just my whole thinking is to bring every week, if we can have a different perspective. Because I think if we are constantly looking at grief from one angle, we only see one aspect of it. But, you know, I, I imagine grief is this multifaceted thing. And if we can sometimes take an, a different look at it and come at it with different knowledge or, or different aspects, that we can get a better understanding of how that feels in our bodies and then we we always talk about this thing and sometimes we talk about it again because it was so interesting. I love that. Um, and I like how you talked about like bringing your child along with you, obviously in a different way, but continuing to bring them through your life with you. Can you give some examples that you've provided in your grief group for suggestions to do that? We uh, We talk a lot about, you know, creating these new connections. Now, I will definitely say that I'm more of a spiritual person. Um, and, you know, actually that's another, another episode altogether, but the night Katie died, I actually had a very prominent visit from her that no one will be able to dispute. Like that was hands down, you know, I, I absolutely know it to my core that that was Katie, but, and that obviously had a huge impact on my grief journey as well, because I know she's with me, you know, and that she's not gone. She's just in, in, in a different place that I don't have the same kind of access to her. But we talk about really being still in our grief as a way to connect. You know, we are, man, as human beings, we're dialed in to be busy, especially as overachievers. And, and I myself, I know I fall into um, this trauma response of busyness right? That, that's just my go-to. But when we're busy, we don't feel things. You know, we don't see things, we don't smell things and so on. And we're, we're sometimes missing these signs that our loved ones are giving us. But even birthdays and angel anniversaries, which hands down are the worst days for any person who's grieving, especially a mom. But how can I celebrate my child on her birthday? right? It's still Katie's birthday. It's still an amazingly special day to me. So, you know, we talk about how are we going to celebrate our kids on their, on their birthday? And we've had all kinds of ideas from, you know, ladybug releases, butterfly releases, uh, you know, those gorgeous lanterns, although fire hazard, be aware, um, you know, placing a bench at their favorite park, uh, scholarship fundraising. I have a in Katie's old high school, there's uh, Katie's closet, which is what we started after her, her her accident. She died in December, um, and I was working with the school to create a scholarship for grad, which was in June. And I felt like I was in the school at least once a week, and got to know the counselors, and and soon came to know that there were many girls and families at the school who simply could not afford the fancy dress, the fancy shoes, the fancy hair, the fancy everything that goes with grad. And I thought, I know people. So literally put up a Facebook post and said, hey guys, I've got this project going on. You know, if you've got a gently used grad dress um, or even, a, you know, a bridesmaid's dress. I think that first year we had 50 dresses that we were able to start Katie's Closet with. And it's just um, a very discreet room you know, at the back of the counseling offices. So nobody has to know. So just always doing projects in our kids' memory, it helps keep them alive. And it also gives us a positive thing to talk to other people about. 
Because a lot of times our friends, our family, our coworkers, they don't know what to say, right? So if I say, hey, you know, I'm doing this thing in Katie's memory, then they're like, oh, okay, she likes to talk about Katie. Um, yeah, I've got a dress to donate to, you know, Katie's closet or this or that. And, and it's just, you kind of always need to be thinking about how you want your child remembered. Cause I think that plays really well into, um, how you want to bring them along with you. Right. Like my Katie was a spark plug. She loved her Sephora makeup, all these kinds of things. So a lot of my projects have really highlighted the person that Katie was. Uh, that's just the way that I want to honor her memory. Absolutely. Being able to say, you know, oh, Katie would have loved this or Katie would have, yeah. like, she would have been all for this project, you know, and we would have been working on that together. I mean, in that way, you are working on it together because she is inspiring all of that good that's happening. Uh, so I, I can really relate with it, um, you know, in a kind of backwards way, but um, my husband and I were struggling with infertility for four years and I, uh, I had a experience at a psychic, uh, and she said, your daughter is like waiting, like your daughter, like you need to do this work for yourself because like the spiritual work for yourself, because like your daughter is like, she's ready. Like she's been ready. She's waiting for you to be ready for you to receive her. And I was like, I don't know what to make of this, but like, I'm going to do the stuff that they said. And then she was born. They said, if you do this within 30 days, you're going to be pregnant and it's going to be your little girl because she's ready. And that's exactly what happened. Um, and so when you say, you know, I know, like, I know that, you know, this is a water bottle. Like, I know for a fact that Katie is with me. I know that like, she's not gone. She's just in a different, we have a different relationship now. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I can relate with, I believe the same thing because my daughter was before she was born was with me. Um, mm -hmm. and I just didn't know it until, you know, that was pointed out to me and that, and it, it really was, she's been with me, you know, eight years now, but I mean, really for that other four years as well. So, uh, it's it's incredible. Um, and so I love that you are able to expose people who are grieving to those different ways of experiencing their grief and of expressing their grief to other people, because uh, being able to try on those different pieces, like the spiritual aspect, like bringing in a psychic, you know, and all of those pieces, being able to try that onto our own situation and see like, yeah, this piece really resonates with me, right? And like, this piece really doesn't, but it does for other people. And so uh, being able to be exposed to the, those different ways of thought um, is action. And it helps us clear some of the weeds uh, and some of the sticks that are that are kind of in our way as we, as we float down that river. I think that is beautiful. And you've got a podcast too called Rising Strong midlife burnout and resilience. Uh, definitely, I can understand the resilience. Your entire <laughs> uh, discussion with us today has been about resilience. Um, but tell us about midlife burnout. Well, it's something that I am definitely seeing in myself and uh, and the, the women around me as well. Uh, before we hit record, I said that I had recently changed the name of my podcast. It was Rising Strong Mental Health and Resilience, which honestly, it still is about mental health, but uh, not everybody identifies or would search out mental health for some of the things that we talk about, like burnout, stress, anxiety, stress management, all of these kinds of things that we face in midlife. And I think um, you ladies are younger than I am, but you know, we get to this point in midlife and it seems like our plate just gets fuller and fuller and fuller and fuller, and we're expected to carry it all with grace. And, uh, behind the scenes, a lot of us are falling apart at the seams. So I just wanted to give again, that space, uh, you know, those people a voice as well. Yeah. We'd love to have you back to talk about that part of it as well. So I think that is so interesting. 
So uh, if you could give one suggestion, you've given a lot of great suggestions for, for somebody who might be on the fence about starting counseling, but if you could give one suggestion, what suggestion might you give to that person? Honestly, just give it a try. I really think that grief in particular, it, it's a team sport, right? You can't do it alone. If you can, or if you do do it alone, it's going to take you a lot longer to to get to a place where you can start living again. Um, I, I do think that there's a lot of people we need on our team, including our GPs, including uh, professionals, psychologists, psychiatrists, whatever that looks like for you. Um, all the people. We need all the support we can get. And a psychologist or psychiatrist, somebody in that in that area of expertise, they have, as I say, expertise to help you in ways that you probably haven't even thought about. You know, peer support is one thing. To talk to another person who's going through the same thing you are is great. But really, you cannot r- replace the expertise that a psychologist or therapist or counselor can bring to the table. And I I believe it, I 100% recommend that everybody seeks out therapy and just try it. Yeah, definitely. Well, thank you so much for being here today. Like Julie said, we'll have to have you back to talk more about midlife burnout. But if you are listening and interested in hearing more about Lisa's podcast, Rising Strong, Midlife Burnout and Resilience, you can find more information at www.risingstrongpodcast.com. And we'll also link her speaking page as well in the show notes. I'm Lisa Baim, and I need a counselor. Awesome. And I'm Krista Hunt. I'm Julie Johnson, and we need a counselor. And so do you. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to the You Need a Counselor podcast. We are so grateful that you're here. Now, we want to hear from you. Text us or give us a call at 515-650-3231. You can also find and connect with You Need a Counselor on Facebook and Instagram. If you've enjoyed today's show, please take a moment to like, review, or leave a comment as all of these things help others to find and benefit from the podcast as well. If you're in the state of Iowa and interested in mental health counseling or behavioral health intervention services, give us a call at 800-531-4236. 